It is now my pleasure to introduce our first keynote panel, a CEO roundtable on radical moves that are changing the healthcare landscape. These executives are leading their organizations through a time of great transformation, addressing big topics like health equity, the social determinants of health, and soaring drug costs. First, we have Wright Lassiter, president and CEO of Henry Ford Health System, based in Detroit. Under his leadership, Henry Ford has expanded through two successful mergers, and the system, which is comprised of six hospitals, a health plan, and a range of ambulatory and retail services, has earned top honors in several publicly reported quality programs. Prior to join, joining Henry Ford, Wright was CEO of Alameda Health System in California, and he held positions at Dallas Methodist Health System and JPS Health Network in Fort Worth. Welcome. Bright Lassiter. Next, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Varzad Mustashari, CEO of Alidaid, a startup aimed at helping primary care doctors transform their practices and form accountable care organizations. Previously, he served as the National Coordinator for Health and IT at the U.S. De Department of Health and Human Services and was a distinguished expert at the Brookings Institute. He also founded the NYC Primary Care Information Project, which equipped physicians in underserved communities with electronic health records. Please welcome Dr. Farzad Mustashari. Next, we have Nympha Saunders, President and CEO of Navicent Health, a nonprofit health system based in Georgia. Saunders recently led a strategic alliance with Atrium Health to improve access, affordability, and equity of care in Central and South Georgia. She has over 45 years of hospital administrative and clinical experience, and her honors include being named by the Georgia Diversity Council as one of Georgia's most powerful and influential women. Please welcome Nympha Saunders. Also with us today is Martin Van Trieste, President and CEO of Civica Rx, a new not-for-profit enterprise created by a group of health systems and philanthropies to ensure that essential generic medications are accessible and affordable. Formerly Chief Quality Officer at Amgen, Martin has deep experience in drug manufacturing and quality and government regulation. He has been called an industry change agent for his work to ensure patients have better access to high quality medicines. Please welcome Martin Van Trieste. And joining us to lead the discussion is another fellow Pittsburgher, Tom Skelton, CEO at SureScripts, a large national health information network. Tom joined SureScripts in 2014, and he leads the company's quest to create a more connected, collaborative health system. An experienced CEO, Tom previously held the role at Foundation Radiology Group and Mises Healthcare Systems, and has an extensive background in the healthcare technology and healthcare service sectors. Welcome, Tom Skelton. How we doing? We ready? All set. All set. All right. Spent a little time together in the speaker's room. My only concern after that is we didn't leave our best game in the back, so let's make sure <laughs> we, we get this right. Well, welcome. Everybody, and good afternoon. Thrilled to be here with such an esteemed panel. Look forward to a discussion with you focused on, as the topic said, radical moves that are changing the healthcare landscape. We've got really a, just a, a terrific group of folks here with some varied backgrounds. Um, from my standpoint, we were talking about this a little bit backstage. You know, I, I've been doing this now close to 40 years, and I don't recall any more exciting time and dynamic time than what we're going through in healthcare right now, and, and look forward to hearing some of the views. So let, let's go ahead and jump on in. We're, we're going to try and frame this really from one of three lenses. We're gonna talk a little bit about the economics, talk about cost, talk about reimbursement, talk about value-based care. Then we're going to move on. We'll chat a bit about care delivery, and then lastly, we'll dive into the consumer element of healthcare and, and pick that up from there. So. 
First question here, guys. Um, you know, let, let's talk about one bold and important move that you've made, either via your business model, via partnerships, uh, etc. And, and maybe what we'll do to kick it off is start inside the walls of the hospital, right? Would you like to to start off there? A, a big bold move, maybe that you made that would resonate with the audience. Thank you very much. Um, you know, anytime you get asked a question about one big bold move, it, it gives you the sense that. Um, in healthcare, we have magic bullets that if we do that one thing, it's going to make all of our problems go away or make our challenges go away. Um, so I guess the one thing I, I will mention is um, something that uh, Henry Ford got a lot of publicity for last year, and that was trying to get really aggressive with direct-to-employer arrangements. Um, and um, some thought that was a little unique for us because we, uh, it's part of our organization, we, we own a large health plan. And, uh, and when General Motors came to us and said, you know, we've been struggling a lot to figure out how do we manage our employee health costs and, and help keep our employees healthy, and we want to talk to you about something radical, um, and we don't want to go through your insurance company. Um, we had an interesting chat in our, in our corporate conference room about, well, hey, do they get to tell us who we can bring to the table, who we can't bring to the table, or what? And, but, um, uh, but as, as has been publicized, we, we struck a, an arrangement, which I hope will be the first of many arrangements, where we really focused on what does it take to keep your population healthier? Um, how do we deliver services for you that cuts through some of the administrative costs that you, that you deal with and other arrangements? Um, how do we ensure that, that both of our incentives are aligned in terms of quality, access, and cost? not just to you, but also to the consumer, to your employee in this case. Um, and how do we make sure that there's alignment around those things so it's not simply a matter of, uh, if I'm just thinking with, with my hospital CEO hat, that you're not doing things that just simply uh, reduces revenue to the hospitals, mm -hmm. on the one hand, um, or two, you're reducing payments to us, and those things don't ever touch your employees. And so you save money, um, but your employees don't. And so, or frankly, we do lots of things, but at the end of a year or two or three, your employees aren't any healthier. Um, and so we feel really comfortable that with a set of 19 metrics, um, and, and they aren't all about cost, they're about access and convenience and satisfaction for, for their 25,000 plus employees that um, we, have, we have something that, that may, may, may be um, something to build on with other large employers. So I'll mention that one. Terrific, yeah. thanks, right. Ninfa, how, how about you? Tell yeah, us about sure. The Bold radical changes is like pinning jello on the wall. You hope that it stays long enough for, <laughs> until the next bold move happens, right? So the one that we probably did this year that I'm quite proud about, as we develop our Center for Disruption and Innovation, we partnered with Georgia Tech's ATDC, which is the Advanced Technology Development Center. Uh, that's really a compendium of many startups. And so we were able to partner with about five startups to try to look at access for care, look at disparities uh, in terms of um, inequity within the system, if you will, on how patients can get there. And as a result, we actually partnered with two that I remember the most because they were the first one. Sensor Med uh, is a minority-owned Georgia-based organization, and we were able to use their technology to do patient monitoring, especially for asthma. And that was really, really important for us, especially for the children. Uh, Navicent Health is not quite in Atlanta, but we are fed by about 52 counties, and it's a combination of some rural, some not rural. So, the ability to try to meet this diversified need is really critical in terms of expediency, but also efficacy. So SensorMed was one of them. We also connected with Health Connect South, and this is a bank and a health center coming together, and we were able to give patients iPads that are from a far-flung area of the different counties, and these are to all diabetic patients within that population. And what's great about that is they are able to enter their data on that iPad, and at any time, they have ready access to any clinician at any time, and the analytics are downloaded by ATTC for us, and we're able to look at trend data. 
in terms of outcome today, of the 75% of this population, we have been able to reduce their hemoglobin A1C by 2.5%, which is absolutely dramatic. You've ever had one, you, you feel like you could never move the needle, right? So this is really incredible. Again, the ability to try to address access and equity of care has been really critical in terms of partnership. Fabulous. So Farzad, let, let's take a jump in your direction here. You, you've obviously got an extensive background in healthcare. Now you're running Allidade. You've got what practices with or partnerships with hundreds of practices across about 27 states, 650,000 physicians. Well, you know, you, you start hey. out as an entrepreneur. Yeah. What is it that you believe that allowed you at the time to make that leap and try and introduce what is certainly a new and radical model? Yeah. So I was a you know, never, I was in the public sector policy making for 15, 20 years of my career uh, and started this company. And the big, bold question, I guess, was how do we get paid? What's your business model? Because you can't really change your business model very easily once you start a company with a certain business model. And we chose to have a business model that is absolutely predicated on taking risk, where we would take risk on the total cost of care for the patients that uh, we and their primary care physicians assume accountability for. And that was scary. So being a startup, and we, we now we're taking risk on seven and a half billion dollars a year of medical costs in, for a five-year-old startup. Um, and to say, like, you, if you don't, actually get outcomes, you are out of business, right? And it's really easy to, to you know, say like, well, that's crazy. Like, get paid fee for service. Everyone else is, <laughs> you know, yes. get paid their license fees, get paid some fees, some management fees, get paid all these other ways. And we said, you know what? We want to get up in the morning thinking about how do we keep people healthy and getting those outcomes, and we're gonna be paid on outcomes and outcomes alone. And the problem is, it takes a while. So for a while there, it's like two, three years, it's touch and go, you're like, well, things are changing, but are they, you know, the processes are changing, but the outcomes are harder, and total cost lags behind utilization. And now we're finally at the stage where we're seeing every single one of our ACOs that have been doing it for three years are now making money based on outcomes. That's so that's the, to me, that's the, that was the, the big bet that seems to have paid off. Fabulous, thank you. So, so Martin, in a sense, your, your whole, given your mission at Civica Rx, you, you are, in a sense, another radical move, right? A, a fundamental belief that access to these generics and the ability to get them at an affordable price point was vital to the system and that something different needed to be done. You've now got about, what, 40 community, or. 40 health systems involved with this that are backing the effort. You're in a great position in terms of moving ahead. You know, so tell us a little bit about that story and what your thoughts were as you made that journey. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. So four very progressive health systems just got tired of two things, right? Drug shortages, mm -hmm. which is a crisis in the United States, especially for these essential medicines that hospitals use every day and predatory pricing of very old generic drugs where artificial monopolies have been created. The most famous one, of course, is Pharma Bro with Martin Scarelli and Daraprim. <laughs> and they've just got so frustrated and they were being promised and promised and promised that some, they're gonna fix the problem. And they just got tired of it. It was over a decade of this going on. And they came together and says, we're gonna start our own nonprofit generic drug company. I mean, what a bold move that was. And so we started with four systems, quickly we grew to seven systems who were the, on our board of directors, the governing members. That's what we launched the company with just over a year ago. And the growth has been steady ever since. We now have 43 systems. And why I think it validates the problem, I live in the Jacksonville, Florida area. Yep. So we have Mayo Clinic, Baptist Health System mm -hmm. and a Catholic system for me to choose from where I go. They all compete for me as a patient. All three of those systems were early adopters in Civica. So they knew the problem was big 
and they threw down, they forgot about competition. They said, how do we work together to solve these problems that benefit all of us? And clearly, drug shortages have a very negative outcome on patients. And it, outside of that, it costs health systems tremendous amount of resources and dollars to manage these drug shortages. The GL estimates that health systems spend about $400, billion, $400 million annually to find more expensive alternatives when the drugs are on shortage, and another $300 million just at inefficiencies within the health system. So clearly a big, bold move to do that. When, when the, it was kind of serendipity how I got involved. And uh, I had retired after 32 years as a pharmaceutical executive most of my life in either R&D manufacturing or the quality function. And one day my cell phone rings and I didn't know the number. And I never answer my cell phone <laughs> if I don't know the number. And just something said, answer the phone. <laughs> and I answered the phone, and this gentleman by the name of Dan Lilliquist, who was the chief strategy officer at Intermountain, proceeded to tell me about this idea. And he spent an hour and a half on the phone with me telling him about this idea, and he asked if I would come and advise him so he could set up a pharmaceutical company. And I did that just as an advisor. <laughs> And then one day, Dan said, we want you to be the CEO. And I said no to him 25 times in, in a matter of two weeks. And uh, I'm a pharmacist by training, and my wife's a pharmacist by training. And my wife looks at me. One week before we make the official announcement of the company, she goes, you got to go do this. So that's how I got to be the CEO of Civica, <laughs> and a big, bold initiative. So, so we, we've got these big, bold initiatives coming, you know, from within the healthcare system. You know, we, we've also got changes being um, pushed towards the system from regulators, federal level, state level, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we, we've got some new primary care payment models coming that are going to impact this. Uh, thoughts on those? A anyone like to opine on what we're probably going to see and what those might mean to us? Yeah, I think particularly with um, uh, an election coming up in another year, the question always around policy is, you know, are we going to see a shift in policy? And three years ago, there was a big question whether there was going to be a, a fundamental shift in policies around um, volume to value, this kind of fundamental idea that we're going to move away from fee-for-service towards paying for uh, outcomes. And what we've seen... Uh, is that there's been real continuity and, in fact, acceleration of that push. And the message, you know, I think Seema Verma, who you're going to hear from, said, like, I'm going to do everything in my power to push towards alternative payment models. Uh, and there has been a great amount of movement, and I think the, the primary care models that are going to be coming out will take effect after the next election. Uh, so uh, I actually expect those to be, a, again, a, no matter what happens, Democrat, Republican, there's going to be a continuation of this push because just like the, the, the old model just is not working. Uh, and, um, and I think we're going to see continuing push towards um, giving responsibility and accountability and data for the total cost of care to folks who are closer to the patient. Um, and I think that trend is going to certainly continue. The details matter a lot. People say to me, like, oh, what do you think about the, you know, direct contracting? There's a new way where people can take accountability for the total cost of care. And I'm like, I don't know, because we haven't seen what the definition of the benchmark is yet, right? right? right. So everything depends on not just having the right North Star that people are moving to, but also having the patience and the iteration to continue working on improving the models and learning from the previous experiences. So, so I would, you know, I would, I would agree with 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 Farzad in terms of the direction. And I think the question will be, what is the ampl the steepness of the of the speed with which we make changes? And so, you know, the reality is, um, <clears throat> while there's a lot of conversation about risk and risk assumption um, in the hospital world too many hospitals and health systems still function principally as fee-for-service mills. Yeah. And so as a result, you don't see as much fundamental change. And until 
organizations have so much of their revenue tied up in risk-bearing arrangements, um, you'll still see a lot of the same behavior yeah. because um, that's, that behavior is what allows that company, that business to, to be around next year, um, a year from now, right? And so, so I, think that, um, I think the question will be how much ramp up will there be in terms of the speed to move? Um, would agree in terms of alternate payment models, and you know, I'm a big believer in them, and we'll talk, I'm sure, at some point more about risk and things of that nature, but you know, Henry Ford's been in the risk business for almost 50 years and functioning as, a, as an integrated um, delivery system, integrated health system with not a lot of hospitals in the big scheme of things you know, to, to care for two million people. You know, we believe that the more risk we take, the better opportunity we have to impact community health. Ninfa, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, about seven years ago, I formed this organization called Stratas, which is a non-equity collaborative of 30 hospitals in Central and South Georgia. And one of the key points that we focus on is how do we begin to look at value? We are still 70% fee-for-service. So having your foot on the fee-for-service and tell you that the future is going to be difficult when you're still basking on this money coming for fee-for-service is difficult uh, for many clinicians and, and providers. And so part of what we're doing right now is working with, we're actually partnering with Aetna on a value-based program that gets the primary care physicians within Stratus, within, within Central and South Georgia, to begin to look at metrics look at process flow, clinical algorithms, outcome expectation, separate and apart from what's going on from fee-for-service. Service. Here's the problem. When they see the money that they're getting from fee-for-service and they see the money that they're getting from value, they're not even measuring the outcomes or working it hard and they're leaving money on the table because the fee-for-service is the one that is right. most notable to them. So I, I agree with Wright. The ability to see the runway, how strong that runway is, but second, what is the adoption curve? So if you think about Roger's adoption curve, there's gonna be two point something that's gonna go gung-ho, they don't care if they understand it or not, they're gonna do it. There's about 35% that are early adopters that will go ahead and process it appropriately, concomitant to their current platform. But the rest are going to be late adopters and laggards and they believe it will never come. So I'm, I don't know if the solution is this expedient sudden death implementation, so reality hits us between the eyes, but the difficulty is what happens to the patients. Mm -hmm. The patients are still in the middle of this. So somehow there's gotta be education. We do so much education at this point. I think we need to get some, some adoption. Incentives don't work, so we're gonna have to get, get some adoption and my worry is it's going to have to become a mandate if people are going to adopt it. So, so Martin, you've heard a little bit about the risk that they're all interested in bearing, have built into their models. Um, you touched briefly on, on access. How, of all, how does all this come together from your standpoint to allow Civica to uniquely add value to that environment? Yeah, so, I mean, I think the big thing is, right, we want to provide quality medicines that are available and affordable. And I think in all three of those categories, quality, availability, and affordability, the industry has failed in one way or the other. And so, and clearly, our hospital-based customers have lost trust in the industry. So what Civica will do is bring quality medicines, you know, mostly domestic source, domestic made, that are gonna be always available in our very robust supply chain that requires redundant manufacturing and strategic stockpiles of these essential medicines. So if there is a hiccup in the supply chain, we have a buffer capacity. And when we talk about affordability, we work on a cost plus basis. Mm -hmm. So we're not saying what will the marketplace bear for something for like Martin Scarelli drug will cost you know, $200,000 annually. So we don't get to say we're gonna charge 175. If we say that manufacturing cost is $100 annually, these are all made up numbers by the way, we would mark it up a, a low percentage. So we're working on a class plus basis and providing quality and really robust supply chain to try to build confidence and trust back in the system. Right, so let, let's stay on that theme of access a little bit. Nympha, I know you've done a lot of work here around 
equity and access and social determinants, et cetera. Maybe tell the audience a, a little bit about what you've been up to there and how you're right. trying to make a difference. So Novice Intel is, like I said, close enough to Atlanta, but it's also uh, receiving patients from about 52 counties, a combination of rural, suburban, and, and urban uh, counties. The difficulty that we have in the region is this incredible disparities of care. And I'll tell you, it is probably one of the key drivers that pushes me to keep looking at access, affordability, and equity, because I think it's really, really important. So one of the things that we've done during the time that we were looking, doing CHNA, all of you do, it, do that, of course, is to really look at data, 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 data. This whole concept of analytics really drives a lot of the algorithm that you're gonna follow, the process, the programs you're gonna adopt, and how well you're going to do in those particular programs. We found two things, three things actually. We had incredible disparity in outcomes of care for our patients with COPD. And it was statistically significant in the sense that the African American population's access to care and access to medications was so disparate compared to all others. So therefore, the readmission rate was the highest. The same was true with congestive heart failure. That was also true for diabetes. And so what we decided is to use Sensor Med, again, one of our vertical partners, to look at a monitoring program for COPD. We also used community paramedics. We own this whole ambulance program. They're on demand. When you have an emergency, they come. Otherwise, they're sitting around waiting for something to happen. So we activated a couple of them to test, to go after the COPD patients and visit them at home and connect them with home health. We did the same thing with CHF. We developed a clinic for them but what we also did because of transportation problem is we went to their respective homes. We have the clinical algorithm that has been posited, that was followed by the clinicians, the community paramedics, and the home health group. We had a clinic at the hospital. We also did this concept called pre-ER triage. So if you think you're gonna use the emergency room, you can call the paramedics, they come to see you, and they decide, do you go to the urgent care center, do you go to a clinic, or do you go to the emergency room? Again, expediency of access. For COPD, after eight months, we were able to eliminate the disparities in outcomes between the African-American population and the other sets of the community. After nine months, we did the same thing for CHF. And then, of course, I told you the rest of the story with diabetes. For the 100% population that we targeted, we were able to reduce the hemoglobin A1C by 2.5 percentage in 75% of the population. So I never really thought we would be able to eliminate disparities because of the social determinants of care or the social determinants in society. But if you unpack it, and try to come up with an intervention. It doesn't have to be a big, audacious idea. Just get it done. The results are truly palpable and in many ways sustainable. Right, anything you'd like to add, add on that you all have done that has borne results that are worth sharing with the audience? Sure, um, so I'll mention a couple of items. So, you know, we're based in Detroit, Michigan, where there's lots of vulnerable populations and, um, many uh, zip codes where health outcomes are, are, are significantly below uh, what they might be in, in more mainstream um, affluent uh, zip codes. So I'll mention uh, two things really quickly. Uh, one, um, our women-inspired uh, neighborhood network. And so Detroit has one of the highest infant mortality rates in the United States. Um, we have the, the dubious distinction of battling Baltimore generally speaking, for one of the higher infant mortality rates. Um, and so we have a program called Women Inspired Network that it's really about a combination of health coaching, uh, a combination of using community health workers along with uh, nurse practitioners to uh, provide outreach to, um, to African-American women principally from targeted zip codes in and around the city of Detroit 
who are um, based upon uh, based upon their social determinants data um, have a high likelihood of um, of having their um, their child not make it. Um, the uh, the rates in in uh, in the African American community in Detroit can be as high as the low twenty percent range, um, which is really challenging. Um, and and what what we are really excited to say is that with our intervention, we have had in the last uh, four years a zero percent infant mortality rate with our with our targeted population, mm -hmm. and so. We've, we've touched about 500 mothers um, um, thus far, and to be at zero is, is pretty outstanding. And so I, I almost get nervous every time I say zero <laughs> because you feel like you know, at some point <laughs> it's not gonna be zero. Um, so that's one, one program I'll mention. Other program I'll mention, uh, it's called our, um, our Henry, Henry for Groceries program. And so one of the social determinants we think about a lot is food insecurity. And in a lot of our communities, um, um, one of the reasons that folks come back and forth to emergency departments, um, uh, fail, um, m much of the advice given by the primary care physician is that they just don't have access to the kind of food that we have access to. And so we, um, based upon an algorithm of, of uh, key conditions, we write um, grocery prescriptions for for many of our patients upon discharge um, from, the emer from the hospital and in some of our primary care clinics. Um, and we partnered with a local food bank. Um, and there are a couple of large food banks in, in Detroit um, to ensure that um, the patients have adequate food um, as one of the reasons that, that uh, one of the contributing reasons for not coming back to our, to our health system. So those are a couple, a couple things I'll mention and given the, the time, I won't, I won't mention any more unless you give me another chance later. <laughs> Farzad, was, was there something you wanted yeah, to add? Yeah, just want to add, I mean, there's obviously a huge amount of interest mm -hmm. um, in the field now around social determinants of health. And I thought Austin Fract had a really excellent piece around the difference between social needs and social determinants, thank mm -hmm. you. And I think it's really important for healthcare providers to consider the social needs of their patients. This patient needs food, housing, transportation. Um, but all too often we see this medicalization of the underlying problems, and we see institutions who are meeting the social needs of some patients and yet are not advocating for the broader, you know, Medicaid expansion <laughs> or some of the broader, uh, almost um, broader safety net. Uh, and, and, you know, these institutions have a lot of power in state assemblies and, and so forth. And I think the next step we have to take is not just think about social needs, but actually think about how do these healthcare institutions exert their influence on changing fundamentally the environment and whether it's a food is a food and housing are made available for everybody. Let's, um, let's shift the discussion a little bit. We were, we were chatting backstage about the fact that, you know, we're, we're in a unique situation right now in terms of where healthcare needs to go to make itself, um, you know, compete effectively in the area of digital interaction with consumers, right? Whether, you know, it's how we get transportation or how we pick our meal and where we're going to eat, et cetera. We're now in a unique spot here. And the great thing about that is we're taking it seriously. The digital tools are being brought to the forefront. Obviously, they impact access. They impact the way that we are all trying to move forward. They impact, it impacts really who gets inside the system. I had an interesting experience recently that ties to one of you know Martin's missions, which is, you know, after since 2000, I have been on the same blood pressure medicine. Um, I don't know if any of you have had this joy due to some of the shortages we've gone through recently. I'm sure you know exactly which family of drugs I'm talking about, but since 2000, I've been on that high blood pressure medicine. Now, I'm sure it's a coincidence that that was the first year I was ever named CEO of any company ever. <laughs> you know, I'm sure it's a coincidence, but you know, everything had always been great. And all of a sudden, the drug that I was on wasn't available. And then the follow-on drug became unavailable. The third drug didn't work. And now I was 
interacting with a very large health system on one side and a very large pharmacy chain on the other side and attempting to do that in a digital fashion. So let, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, Farza, you've got a unique perspective on this having you know, done what you did at, at ONC for some time. Are, are we making enough progress? What does it look like in your eyes? Yeah, you know, uh, as at the Office of National Coordinator for Health IT, we had the power, uh, but also the limitations on the power of regulations. And so we could regulate the electronic health record industry to say, you must be certified to be able to provide a patient portal or something. And it's like, well, but what does that mean? Well, okay, what does it mean? And then we'll tell you exactly what the components of a, you know, discharge summary have to be, and then you get compliance. And is that good? I, I don't know. You get like a checkbox of like, it has this, it has this, it has this, it has this, but there's no meaning to it because people did it to get a check. They didn't do it to actually engage patients. And so the experience of um, regulations as a tool to require information sharing with patients has been mixed, I would say. The availability is there, but the use is pretty low. And we're seeing the same thing. There was recently a study that found that with, you know, the newest technology innovation has been Fire APIs, and it's fantastic that we have the technology interoperability pieces set, and yet the actual number of human beings who have apps who access that information through APIs is vanishingly low. So I think it is necessary but not sufficient. What we really need are tools that people actually want to use to solve their healthcare, daily healthcare problems. Um, and you know, I'm optimistic. I'm a little less optimistic about the whole shopping consumer like consumer mentality. There's some certain things like drugs, like GoodRx. A lot of people have the app on their phones. But for interacting with healthcare more broadly, I actually think one of the most important kind of shoppable moments is when people choose their health insurance. And that we are, you know, if anyone has tried to help someone choose a health plan on the exchange, <laughs> so it sucks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it sucks, yeah. right? So that I think it would make maybe one area where people's own data could help them make decisions. Sure, and having the data doesn't necessarily cause the behavioral change you're oh. looking mm -hmm. for, right? We, we introduced a price transparency program. We got it out there. We have 200,000 physicians using it. It is massively challenging to get that workflow to the point that everybody loves it, everybody will change their current behaviors, and everybody will make use of it. And it takes a, a tremendous number of partnerships. You know, right? Right? Maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the innovations that you all are doing at Henry Ford to engage consumers where they now are versus where they sure. used to be. And and your price transparency that you're going to have to do. Yeah. So one quick point about um, tools. I think one of the fundamental challenges that our society faces around using tools like this is um, there isn't sufficient health literacy mm. to make to take advantage of some of the tools that we put out there. And so we put out these tools and with the presumption that well, some of us can use them, and some of us can, and some of us can't. But a lot of the general public can't. So that's just uh, just one uh, unsolicited comment there. Um, so we're trying to do a lot, acknowledging though that that this is a journey and we are in mile one or two of a, of a marathon. And so I, I don't want anyone to sort of think that I'm suggesting that we have solved this at Henry Ford. A um, couple quick examples. Um, Henry Ford, we used to call it, we branded initially Henry Ford Quick Care, and then we decided that, that um, people didn't like Quick Care. They thought it meant something <laughs> different than what it was. Um, but, our, but our Henry Ford Quick Care effectively was our pilot to begin doing millennial clinics in um, highly populated areas where we serve. Um, and so these, these clinics are, were such where um, everything was done electronically. You would book your physician appointment like you book an open table mm. um, reservation. Um, you would get a text message 15 minutes before the provider was ready. Um, um, there was no parking because it was in an urban setting, so we had bike sharing. Um, stations so that folks who were in, you know, downtown Detroit could just get on a bike share and ride from wherever they were in downtown to um, to right in front of the clinic, put the bike in the little rack and then walk in. Um, no waiting rooms. 
with sort of the presumption that, you know, if you think back to, to the notion of, you know, pull, tech, pull uh, um, um, approaches in lean, and that so there's no waiting room. I mean, there's a couple chairs, but like not a waiting room. And so that's a concept that um, we tested it with, um, with Quicken Loan employees. Um, so we, Dan Gilbert allowed us to get some of his folks and, and they, that concept they loved. And so that's a concept that we're utilizing in highly populated sort of dense urban areas, uh, um, sort of one example. Like many health systems, um, we utilize MyChart, um, which is a tool that we have 600 plus thousand people utilizing regularly, which allows them not only to get results, but also to engage in um, uh, both asynchronous and synchronous uh, interactions with, with a provider. And so that's, that's a tool that, that uh, we're finding really useful. Um, and we've recently, I've recently hired a, uh, a chief experience officer who we have tasked with creating an end-to-end -end digital experience um, for, for Henry Ford. And so we're still very early in that process. And so that person's been on board four months. And so uh, we're not ready to, to uh, unveil anything um, as of yet. And, and when it comes to price transparency, because we are integrated with an insurance uh, company, we have had a price transparency tool out for all of our health plan members. And we have about 600,000 health plan members. And so we've had a tool out um, for those shoppable um, uh, services. And then we also have about a dozen people, this is not digital, this is the old school way of doing things, that field phone calls mm -hmm. from consumers saying, I'm, I have to come in and have a hip replacement. What's it gonna cost me? Um, and so we, go, we have a lot of folks in our revenue cycle function that, that spend their time um, on the phone. Mm. Um, and we have, we have created a tool um, called Henry Ford Bill Pay that allows people to do that electronically now. Um, and we still get a lot of people who still want to call because they find that it's too complicated. Um, and they'd rather just tell someone and have them sort of uh, uh, figure out what their issues are as opposed to using our automated tools. So, so we're trying to decide is that because the tools aren't meeting their needs or because right. it's just really complicated and healthcare is, is still a, a fairly black box um, scenario for many consumers. So. so Martin, how about your side? Yeah, I, I mean, as a consumer, <laughs> right? Um, you know, one, it has to be so user friendly and so intuitive, because the range of people you have to address, right? My youngest daughter who's like a computer wizard, and my father, right? Who said, like, like barely uses, ever saw a computer. So there's such a large, population with diverse, so it has to be so intuitive you can just use it. But you know, stealing a line from the movie Field of Dreams, build it and they will come, mm. is not true, right. <laughs> right? And what we do a lousy job in healthcare is promoting the product. GoodRx is so successful because I can guarantee you before the end of the night you go watch TV, you're gonna see a GoodRx commercial, right? That's so successful, highly intuitive, but more importantly, the awareness that the product's out there. So that's something I think if we really want to make changes in this digital space, you've got to focus on letting people know what the product is and it's out there and how to use it. So we've only got a few minutes remaining here. Let, let's take a crack at looking out over the horizon a little bit, right? We've got a, an election coming up in 2020. The reform will continue. There's a question about what it will look like, but certainly change will continue. It will be influenced strongly by the regulatory regime, it will be influenced strongly by, by the government, the executive branch, the legislature, et cetera. You know, what, what do you think we'll see? What would you like to see that maybe isn't front and center? Martin, you wanna start us? Mm. Well, I'm, I'm scared of, you know, massive government takeover, right? I mean, I think government involvement's important. I think regulation's important, but a massive change to the way we do insurance is not going to fix healthcare, right? Healthcare and insurance are not one in the same. And so that's my biggest fear. Okay. Ninfa? I guess I'm worried about the threat towards privatization. One of the things that's made this country incredible is that its ability to privatize the industry and be entrepreneurial. And if we begin to believe that there's one solution and that solution is a mandate from one group 
of organization or, or the government, I think we would have lost more than we can ever imagine. I, I think uh, collectively the th kinds of things that have been tried to control unsustainable cost growth, like shifting more and more cost to patients and the consumer, high deductible plans, the, the craziness of the pharma pricing system, um, I think the out of network billing and surprise billing, like people, we have, we, the people who have been influential in healthcare, have failed to give people solutions for the problems they're feeling, and they're feeling worse about it. It used to be people felt like, oh, you know, I don't like insurance companies, but my insurance company or my plan is okay. They don't feel that way anymore, and so they're willing to embrace pretty radical change, and I think rather than just say we can't have radical change, we need to say what is the counter solution to that, and I do think that at some level having a, for example, regulatory cap on things that you can do on surprise billing is, is I think it's going to happen because it's, it's gone so far out there, and you know, uh, if we can have a competition then that's great, but in so much of healthcare, there is not competition. I think that's the big elephant that we haven't talked about, right. and maybe there'll be another session next year, right. is uh, you can't assume that you're gonna have market forces fix healthcare if there's no market, if there's no com competition, and there's consolidation and monopolies all over the place. So we'll see if that, anyone has the uh, solutions to tackle that. Right. I would just say uh, quickly, one, I'm generally of very much an optimist. I generally believe the glass is more than half full. Um, having said that, what I worry about in the short term is that the uh, political environment um, isn't, doesn't appear to be ripe for, for me to have any kind of structured solution to a very complex issue like healthcare. Um, and so what will happen in the short run, I think we'll see fits and starts around things like pharmacy, uh, pricing, um, addressing that issue. Um, I think you'll see hospitals get hammered a little more around do more to help this problem somehow, some way, and some of that will be regulatory at the federal level, some of that at the state level. Um, and I'm hopeful that we'll address the coverage and access issue, which we haven't been addressing as of late, and we're going backwards around that particular issue. Well, with that, I want to thank all of you in the audience for being here with us today. If you could join me, please, in a round of applause for the panel.